Okay, thank you, Omar, and thank you, Leslie. Thank you both for having me here. Um, it's really an honor to be with you at Cooper Union. Um, and in case we have any Lakota speakers uh, with us, Leili Akichitahanska, Leili Long Soldier, Imachiapi, Daya Hipina Chantewashte, Nabe Chiyusapi. So I said, um, I come here with like a good heart and a warm hand, as they say, something like that. Um, so I uh, wanted to, this evening, I wanted to share some work, a number of projects over the last 10 or 15 years um, that, you know, uh, like the title to my lecture says, where it really felt like writing and making things, my, a visual practice and writing practice were uh, one and the same almost. And if they aren't one and the same, then they're, they're, they're interwoven for sure, um, very closely connected. Uh, so I, have, I do work visually, but for me, the, all of it together, the writing and the making, because we must remember that poesis means to make, at the root of it. So uh, we are, whether we're making a poem or we're making a visual work, for me, it is a process of thinking. Basically, think, if you will, even thinking out loud. Uh, in most of these projects, I'm thinking out loud with you. And so I don't always have the answers to things, uh, but I'm, I'm thinking, I'm working on something, and then I'm sharing it. So uh, it, it's all one and the same together, both the poems and both the visual work. Um, right, so a lot of that comes also uh, working visually because I know that I'm most known for Whereas after that was published, that's why I'm usually invited to speak. <laughs> but, um, I, I, a lot of this comes out of the desire of my visual work, uh, a kind of um, need to move my hands and to do something. And I don't know why, but I can't stop it. I want to make something, I want to do, so, I want to, and it's also, I think, um, a way of getting energy out, but, still being able to be quiet, if that makes sense. So, uh, and I'm gonna share some of that work with you. And then I will talk about the written work that has come out of um, each of those projects. Um, I will prepare you, if any of you have listened to or, or viewed some of my other uh, lectures, um, I am sharing some imagery from previous lectures, but in, in this context, I'm gonna talk about um, how those practices are um, interconnected. So it's a little bit a different angle. Um, okay, I'm gonna to try to be techy and share screen. Here we go. Okay, Omar, shake your head if you can see this. Our thumbs up. Okay, good. <laughs> I felt so fancy today because I, I just love PowerPoint. They have all these fancy layouts. And I saw this one, I said, oh my God, this is so cute. So anyway, I chose this just for you guys um, with the stars and so forth. And later in our lecture, you'll see why um, the stars are so um, significant to some of the work that I'm doing. So we're going to talk about when language is not enough. And, and that is actually true for me, too. I have to say that. I think there's something when language is not enough in the sense that uh, I feel like we need to see 
we need to see uh, we need to see color. We need to um, see physical texture and shape in order to sometimes understand something. I mean, for me, sometimes sometimes it cannot be articulated through words. What what I want to say to you, it just can't. And so that is another reason for working visually. So I'm gonna go back to one of my early, early projects. And I wanted to start with this one because um, you, if you have read Whereas, you may recognize some of the text that came out of this project. Uh, this is from one of my early exhibits called Buffalo Book. Um, and it was part of a larger um, show uh, for Putea Oyate. Putea Oyate means um, Buffalo people in our uh, language. And so that is what we understand ourselves as, um, as Lakota people. Um, so I can't remember, I think there were maybe five or six other Lakota artists in this, um, in this show. And it was held at the Heritage Center at Red, Red Cloud Indian School on Pine Ridge. And I wanna say this was maybe 10, 12 years ago. Maybe ten, yeah, something like that. Okay, so what this is, is um, you will see here a kind of figure standing. Um, the black you see around this figure is what I call my buffalo robe. <laughs> uh, I remember when I delivered it to the gallery and the girl uh, working in the gallery said, oh, what? she was a young Lakota person. She said, oh, what is this? And I said, oh, this is my buffalo robe. And then she gave me a look like she was unconvinced. <laughs> like that didn't look like any buffalo robe to her. But um, so I was taking a lot of uh, artistic, artistic liberty. But um, in any case, um, this is a buffalo robe uh, and then buffalo, silver buffalo sewn down the back of the robe onto going down onto the floor and up the wall. It's very hard to tell in this, um, you know, the scale, but this larger buffalo is about four, four and a half or five feet tall. This uh, this row, this figure here, the the dress um, figure that I made underneath, that's full size, so it's about five and a half, almost six feet tall. So altogether, this is about ten to eleven feet high. This installation, it's about eleven feet tall. Um, so it is quite, you know, it's, um, it takes quite a bit of space. Um, and then down here are some roots and these are, this is grass, metal grass. Uh, at the time I used to live out in the country on the Navajo Nation. Um, that's where my, uh, my kid is, uh, we raised uh, my kid there. And so, uh, yeah, I lived out in the country. So the closest place that I had to get any supplies was, I, there were no art stores. So I always worked with uh, very accessible materials that I could get at Ace Hardware Store in Chinle, Arizona. <laughs> and so the, these silver buffalo are made out of rolls of window screen, the black robe is made out of black window screen that I bought there at Ace. Inside, I, the, I'm forgetting what it's called, the dress form. I made a dress form inside that's made out of chicken wire. Um, and then the grass and the roots are made from um, sheets of metal that I cut down. Inside each of those buffalo is text. So you'll see here, um, it's titled Buffalo Book. So I chose a text that 
sort of uh, resembled, um, you know, I, instead of doing handwritten text, I, I printed it out. Um, so this is what I wanted to show you. Um, here's the front side of that. And I don't know if you can see down the middle, down the middle of the dress, inside is what I call the spine, the spine of the dress. And can you, if you can see it, it's like little hanging, um, like almost little placards or little uh, strips of paper um, going down the middle and they're hanging in a column. And those uh, pieces of paper are all uh, family names from our community that have the word uh, bull in them, bull. So when you see, usually when you see uh, family names from the Northern Plains that have the word bull in it, it is not uh, a cow, like, um, yeah, not a cow bull, but it's a, uh, it means it's referring to Buffalo. Um, and so that history and those stories, our family stories and our connection to the Buffalo uh, is really old. So um, I worked with like some fam, I called up different family members and also some um, family friends, some friends, and they helped me compile that list. And it was really beautiful. Um, in the end, it was very educational. Uh, I learned a lot. And the list ended up being much longer than what I could include in this art piece. So I really, I can't remember how many names, maybe, well, I'll show you here. So this, these are the names that are in the middle of the dress. And I'll just read them for you because I think it's so beautiful. I think it's a kind of a poem in itself. Uh, and it really speaks to the, the embedded poetry and imagery of um, our people. Um, just as we are, right? The way that we see the world, the way that we see each other and so forth. So um, I'll start at the top. This, was, this is probably recognizable to all of you. Sitting Bull is the first name, right? Bull Man. Bull Man is my grandma's, um, my grandma's name. Um, Black Bull, Left Hand Bull, Jumping Bull, Three Bulls, Short, Bull, crazy bull, two bulls, bull child, medicine bull, brown bull, thunder bull, bull chief, tall bull, wallowing bull, red bull. Oh, you guys recognize that one, right? <laughs> In uh, contemporary terms. Uh, yellow bull, bad heart bull, plain bull. Bull bear, white bull, eagle bull. Going down the back of the dress, inside those um, those silver buffalo, down the back um, there. This is the text, and so. I'll read the text there. And you may recognize this because uh, the, this is where I got the opening lines to Whereas, my book Whereas. So this project led to the opening of this book for me, uh, although I changed it a little bit, but I wrote, this is the book I've been meaning to write. An account of each family member before me, after to pronounce the names, sound out each letter, make a space in the mouth for the grasses, grasses, grasses. Um, so, you know, when it uh, those lines reached whereas, 
um, it became more, uh, I think I wrote, make room in the mouth for grasses, grasses, grasses. Uh, so it changed a little, but this was the origin of that. And it was the origin of that opening really came from this project in which I was working with our community, with family, um, thinking about our, our, our uh, historical or origins, our connection to the Buffalo, understanding ourselves as Buffalo people, and um, you know, all of that. So that is where it came from. Okay. Moving into whereas, um, when I was writing Whereas, um, which for those of you who are not familiar with the book, um, the second half of my book of Whereas uh, is a response to the national apology to Native Americans. Uh, and that was signed by Obama in December 2009. So, uh, and it was not very um, publicized. There were not a lot of people who knew about it at the time, um, but it really got under my skin <laughs> in many ways. So I started writing um, some poems to sort of um, address that apology. Um, and about a third of the way into um, that response I was writing, I, I thought it might be nice to hear from other people in our community, in the Lakota community. So I called up one of my friends uh, who worked at the Heritage Center at Red Cloud. And um, I asked them if they knew of a space where I might be able to, um, I had the idea, or I wanted to project uh, project some, some of the text from that apology, project it onto a wall, and then invite community members to come and interact with that text uh, and respond to it themselves. And my friend there, uh, Mary Bordeaux, she immediately said she would love to host it. Uh, and they hosted it for three months, uh, this, this um, installation. So this is what we did. This is the space inside uh, the Heritage Center. And you see there's three walls. So left, back, right wall. There's the column in front. Um, and the back wall, especially, uh, we, uh, I projected the section of the apology that um, addresses the boarding school era, which, um, as you know, uh, Red Cloud, Red Cloud Indian School is one of the early um, Catholic boarding schools on Pine Ridge. Um, and it was so funny because the, the um, the administration, the Catholic administration there was so supportive of the project, but I don't think they realized how subversive this really was because I was like, you know, like projecting this uh, right in their space um, and asking the community to respond to it. But anyway, this is like the first or second day that it was open. And there's some young people there you see from the high school. And I just was so blown away at such a young age. They already, uh, you know, they, they were already so perceptive and so aware of all the same issues that I was thinking about, you know, as an adult. Uh, so it's, it was really telling to me, number one, it was affirming that I was sort of not overly sensitive but it was affirming that other people were reading this text and sort of um, picking up on some of the things I was as well. Um, but also just that I'm not such a smart person. 
even our very, very young people are already thinking about these things. They already pick up on them. So, you know, uh, it's, it's really telling that our, our native people from a young age, they already know what's happening. So uh, anyway, here we are. You can see, for example, this young person who writes apologize to my grandparents, right? That's her, that was her response. There were a few really beautiful ones. Um, this one was actually, I want to say my favorite of the whole, almost my my favorite of the whole installation. Uh, I saw three girls um, huddling together in the corner, uh, in the back corner, and they were all talking and you know planning out what they were going to write together. So I had no idea what they were going to write. So they were back there uh, staying busy and. Um, when they stood up uh, in big yellow letters, they said, if you're so sorry, give us back the Black Hills. And it gave me chills when I saw that because that is really the essence of all of this. As you guys probably know, the Black Hills is part, uh, a, a very vital, important part of our uh, contract, our treaty with the US government which was completely broken, right? As soon as they found out there was gold <laughs> there, uh, we had the cavalry and all kinds of folks moving in. Um, but that is still a standing part of our agreement with the US government. And really it, it is our land. And so um, to, to apologize, but not to rectify um, or honor what we have already agreed upon, you know, it's, it's sort of an empty apology, right? So I felt like, wow, these kids, the girls, I think they were probably 15 or 16 years old. Oh, they just cut right to the heart of it. And I loved that. Um, this here is my grandma shop, my grandma, um, Mabel. And um, she, I was so lucky. Uh, she joined, she came to the exhibit, my cousin brought her. And I don't know why um, I have to put that there, but it just really was an honor <laughs> to have our elder, uh, our grandma come and sort of bless that space for us. Um, you know, once again, you see here, better than an apology would be to honor your promises. And at the end of the um, installation, after three months, those walls, every inch was packed. It was packed with responses um, so that people were actually using ladders to write at the very top of the ceiling. So um, it was, and I, I should have grabbed some pictures for you of, of the final what it looked like at the end, but it was really um, incredible. So this, it's not, I didn't actually take any of the text that people wrote on the walls. I didn't take any of it and put it into my own poems, but this installation, working visually and working with space and working with community, it was very important to me as a kind of gauge like taking the temperature, uh, uh, a kind of measure, counter, you know, a, a counterbalance, if you will, to, to sort of like think about, as I said before, am I on the right track? Um, am I too sensitive? Or am I, you know, and I found out I wasn't. <laughs> and I found out that, um, yeah, uh, a lot of our people are, thinking in this, about some of the same things. Okay. I have so much to share tonight. Oh my God. So I really, especially the last couple of projects, not this one, but um, the more recent ones this last year, I really wanna be able to get to those. So I'm gonna share some work, some other visual work uh, from a, 
an exhibit called uh, Midakuye Oyasin. And um, for some of you, some of you might be familiar with this phrase. It means something like um, all my relatives or we are all related. So a lot of um, people, even people who are not uh, Lakota, but they've been to different gatherings, um, you'll hear this a lot at native, um, native events or gatherings because uh, a lot of people have like adopted this phrase. Um, I think people like the idea that, oh, you know, we're all related. <laughs> we're all, you know, uh, we're all relatives and so on. People seem to, that brings people a lot of um, comfort, I think. But um, uh, the, the, the two artists who organized this or the two people were uh, Mary and Clementine Bordeaux. And they were more interested, they invited me to participate in this exhibit because they were interested in a sort of deeper meaning of what it means, what it is to be a relative in Lakota culture. Because that is really almost the, the heart or the center of our belief system, the idea of relationship and the idea of um, the understandings about kinship. Uh, responsibility and obligations we have to one another, um, to, to other humans as relatives, but the rest of creation as our relatives. So believe it or not, even uh, you know, in our beliefs, we really understand ourselves as being related to everything of uh, creation. So, um, you see that in the previous project with Buffalo people, we understand ourselves as being closely related to the Buffalo nation. You'll hear that kind of um, language, the way that we talk about our um, relatives, our animal relatives and so on. So um, anyway, they were, I'm trying to find the cursor, here we are. They were interested in doing this, invited me to participate Oh gosh, before I move on, I'm talking so much, but here I go. Uh, what you see here is called a star quilt pattern. So if you've been in the Northern Plains, if any of you have been up there, uh, you may have seen star quilts. This is a very familiar um, item and an image um, in Northern Plains culture. So we give each other star quilts for many um, reasons. You'll see them at graduations, when people pass away, for little babies when they're born and so on. If you're lucky, you might have a nice little collection by the time you get old of star quilts. Um, so the point is, is I was invited to participate in this exhibit and I didn't want to just write poems and on eight and a half by 11 pieces of paper, but I didn't know what to do. And I had a pattern that my cousin gave me and it was sitting in my room and it looked like this. And the people who make these star quilts, they use these uh, graphs, these patterns to sort of map out their designs ahead of time. And they get really fancy up there. I mean, people make shapes like, uh, they make like buffalo heads. They make all kinds of interesting shapes. So you can use this ahead of time to like color it in and figure out, you know, just plan ahead. So I had this sitting in my room and what I decided to do was I, I don't know how to sew, but I liked, as you know, I like to work with accessible materials. So what I did was I took that um, pattern and I expanded the diamonds to one foot long each. So it, it's hard to tell, but each of these diamonds is one foot long, 12 inches from tip to tip. And so um, from this top, tip to the bottom, one, two, three, four, five, six. 
This is actually six feet long from top to bottom. What I did in the meantime was I listened to some community um, interviews with different um, language speakers, Lakota language speakers, talking about midakuye oyasin, like what that means, that idea, um, that belief system is in our culture. I listened to these interviews and I wrote some poems based on those interviews. And I laser cut the text into these diamonds. And then I sewed those diamonds together with copper wire. You see a bowl of copper wire and so on. And then all together, this is what this, the star starts to look like when I started putting the sections together. Oh, this was really fun too. Uh, this was actually a buffalo hoof, a photograph of a, a buffalo hoof in the mud. And I, I took that photo to the laser cutter guy and he actually used that photo to cut the hoofs out. That was really fun. Anyway. And then this is what um, the quilts look like. I took, again, you'll see I use, uh, you know, over the years I've become comfortable with certain materials. And you can see now I'm using the silver window screen again <laughs> and the copper wire again. And those are, uh, so I took the, that star and then I sewed it onto the, um, four rolls, uh, four panels of that window screen here. This is a multicolored one. It was not laser cut. This one I did stencil work on. Um, so that's a close up. And this one was titled Mosquitoes. And so you can see I did some stencil work there. I made my kid help me, <laughs> make my kid help me with everything, poor thing. This is really fun. Um, I'm just gonna show you some of the other work in, this is not my work, this is Mary's work, Mary Bordeaux. She made some sculptures. Uh, this is a buffalo skull, a buffalo head skull. This is a stone. She made some little, um, three, some 3D sculptures and suspended them from the ceiling. And what happens is the people, visitors to the gallery can come in and put their heads inside these objects. Like that. So that's what it looks like. Um, let's see. And inside, like this is inside the, I think this is inside the stone. She sewed sweet grass, braids of sweet grass, and she put a little TV. And this, uh, she has little interviews from various community members talking about what it is to be a good relative in um, Lakota culture. So it's sort of like an all around experience. Uh, that she created. This was a porcupine. <clears throat> and this is understanding that we consider buffalo, we can even consider stones, our relatives. Can you imagine? That's, um, there's a whole story about that. Uh, here's a porcupine she hung on the wall. And that also had a little speaker inside that told you how to be a good relative. This is Mary and this is Clementine. Clementine did the interviews, Mary did the sculptures, and then I did the stars. I just put a picture because they're so cute. I love them. So, um, and so out of those star quilts, this is the form of those um, poems. And this is how they look on the page. Uh, they have translated easily to the page. Uh, and so they are something that text is something that I can use also in a manuscript or, you know, in, in just a, 
uh, paper, a page uh, form, um, even though they came out of that very physical way of working, that physical form. That, those stars are like 12 feet by 12 feet, by the way. They just take up the whole room. But it's so beautiful, too, that I can bring those um, pieces, um, share them in other ways as well. So I'm going to read this piece for you quickly, um, just because I noticed that it's been circulating. Uh, even today, someone was putting it, I don't know where, Facebook or Instagram or something, and tagging me. But I guess uh, it seems to be a piece that people are um, circulating given the times that we're in the pandemic. And then we also have some um, conflict overseas. So um, the way that I design these pieces is you start at the top and you weave your way down and the reader can choose any direction they wish to go. And it will make 10 to 12 different combinations, different poems. So I'm gonna read it the way that I intended. As we <clears throat> embrace the future, we work to understand the grief we shift into light across our faces. As we embrace the present, we struggle to find the grief we shift into light across our faces. As we resist the present, we struggle to unbraid the grief we wield into light across our faces. As we resist the past, we struggle to unbraid the grief we bury as ash across our faces. As we resist the past, we fail to question the grief we bury as ash across our faces. And here's another one just quickly that is about speaking our language to speak our tongue. Um, one, of the speak, one of the interviews, they talked about learning our language and also song as a form, one of the best forms for learning language and so on. Um, and of course, in our culture, we have a million zillion songs for every single occasion people actually make jokes about it. So um, I thought it was uh, really beautiful to hear that. So that's where this came out of this piece. This one was the speaker was talking about anger, the need to address our anger as uh, native people, as Lakota people, if we don't address it as individuals or as a community, you know, it comes out in other ways. So it's very important to um, take care of that anger to um, express it in some way, healthy ways. Um, this one was uh, someone who was talking about our dictionary. Um, and that's a whole other lecture I could give about the politics of dictionaries, language. Actually, I'll return to that in a few minutes. Oh my gosh, you guys, I'm running out of time. So I'm gonna zoom through this because I wanna get to the, the more recent projects. So here we go. This is Zint Kala Shah. Um, so the multicolored um, star quilt you saw was based on a short story called The Widespread Enigma Concerning Blue Star Woman, written by Zint Kala Shah where I took some of those, uh, you know, um, phrases from that short story and uh, made what I call, I suppose, found poems. Um, but what I found with, that was really interesting is how working with that language in this way 
a lot of the issues that she was writing about then, we, we use the same language to talk about it and write about it now. Issues of identity, um, issues of land, resistance, um, uh, land uh, ownership, all of that. So um, it was really interesting. So that's what these look like here. They're super fun to read. I wish I had more time, but I'm zooming through so that I can show you more recent stuff. Oh my God, I'm gonna zoom through this too. I'm so sorry. I'm just gonna do it because I wanna show you what I worked on this last year. We'll save this for another time. Let's put a pin in it, okay? But it was super fun. I'm just telling you that. It was interactive installation. And what I did was I made some found poems. Oh my God. Found poems with all these scraps of paper. Okay. That was so cool. Uh, and I made them into epistolary pieces. I will share with Omar, you have to invite me again. I'll share those at another time. <laughs> okay. Look at that. I wrote one piece dedicated to the children at Kamloops Indian Residential School. Um, but anyway, we'll, we'll talk about that later. I'm gonna move on to the work I did this last year on Lakota star knowledge, uh, some visual work. And the reason I'm so excited about this because I got to work in a way I never thought I would ever do. And for the first time ever, I worked architecturally. Can you imagine? Like, how does that happen? I'm just a poet. When I got to work like with uh, a building and with the outside and with um, steel and metal and all kinds of stuff. So I'm gonna share some of that. Um, I should note that this, much of this work, uh, this whole project was in collaboration with Keith Braveheart, Marty Tubles, and Michaela uh, Carpio Patton. Please Google those artists. You will just, oh my gosh, you will just be blown away. Each one of them is such a, a beautiful, they do such beautiful work, each of them. And we were assisted by um, Richard Tudox, who shared a lot of um, Lakota star knowledge. And um, Tilda St. Pierre, she's my aunt. She helped me also with some of the language work. So you guys may or may not know this, but we have very, very old star maps, very old, like on Buffalo Hides. And um, we have our own constellations. And each constellation has a story connected to it. So this group of artists, me, Keith, Marty, and Michaela, we spent like a year, a year and a half researching, um, doing Zoom meetings with our uh, culture bearers, what we call culture bearers, um, which is basically folks in our community who know those stories and have that knowledge. And um, working on this project together. So what we were commissioned to do by Oglala Art Space, Oglala Lakota Art Space, they asked us to design some um, sculptural work for the outside of their new building. This is on Pine Ridge. This is right in Kyle, South Dakota. Uh, where a lot of my family lives. And so it was really an honor. And they wanted, it, they wanted the work that we designed to be based on star knowledge. So um, we spent a lot of time, as I said, researching and then meeting and trying to design. So here's some other, here's uh, another map of some of our constellations and the Milky Way there, you see. Um, the very, very interesting thing 
um, you guys, this will blow your socks off. So you have to Google it on your own and you can learn more. But um, some of the constellations in the sky are Lakota constellations, mirror land sites in the Black Hills. So there are actually, uh, what do you call it? like satellite photos taken of the Black Hills and the sites where we hold ceremonies at certain times of the year. Those ceremonies are held um, when, according to the constellations, according to alignment. But there have been um, uh, satellite photographs and those sacred sites themselves mirror the constellations above. So, um, there is a connection between land and sky. Um, when I first learned that, I just like, I, it blew, have you seen that emoji with the, the person and the brain sticking out? That was me. So I just couldn't believe it. So um, from that, we have this symbol called Khapemini. I'm probably not even saying it correctly. I have to put my Lakota tongue, my throat, khapemini. You will see this a lot in our historical arts, especially this symbol, okay? This is the two triangles that meet at a tip. This represents that connection from above and below. What is above is mirrored below. Uh, uh, what's the saying? As above, so below, right? Uh, it is not just a flat symbol though. It's also um, two, uh, it's conical, conical shape. And if you will, it's almost a helix, right? So if you make it 3D. Uh, so there are main, many ways that this symbol uh, recurs in our, um, in our philosophy, in our belief system. But after a year and a half, this is the group sculpture that we made. Sorry, I need to turn up my phone. Here we go. This was the group sculpture that we made. Above you see our constellations. Below you see the land site that is connected to that constellation and the symbol. Um, behind you see a mural of, it's not quite finished, that's in progress, but a mural of the Morning Star. Um, this is a close up, another, uh, where you can see the land site and a magpie and so on. So it was really rewarding, really beautiful to work on this together. Um, my part of, of that, I was really humbled working with these visual artists because they are really skilled. Um, but my sketches and my drawings are not the best. But I was assigned the portal area as an ind we each had an individual area. And I was assigned the portal above the awning. So what I decided to do was I wanted to, I decided to work with uh, Richard Two Dogs and um, I wanted to install the Morning Star song um, above in the portal area. So Richard, uh, Mr. Two Dogs was really kind enough to, I wish I could share the recording of him singing this, but he sang the song and sent me a recording um, and the words. And then um, my auntie helped me uh, work with the language so that it was also in female. Our language is gendered. So we have male and female voice, uh, ways of speaking uh, Lakota. So that's why our young people, we have to be very careful uh, <laughs> who, you're, who you're learning from and so on. Um, so. Anyway, um, so we did that, uh, it was very kind of him. This is the translation of the Morning Star song. 
uh, it says the morning star is appearing. I send a voice with a sacred pipe. That's our Chanumpa. Everything sacred in the universe hears me. I worked with uh, uh, actual blueprints. Uh, so that's why I'm saying I had never worked architecturally. This blew me away. So this was part of my work, getting the measurements, dimensions for everything. And what we did was we cut those words out of steel and we powder coated them with gold, not actual gold, but gold paint. And we installed them into the awning. So you see these guys are uh, installing that lettering. And what I wanted to do was work with shadow and light. That's what I wanted. So this is what it looks like with all of those, um, the lines installed. We had the first three sections are male voice, second three sections are female. So this is what it looks like with the sun and the sidewalk. And that's what I wanted is for the, the text to be read on the sidewalk. As people walk into the building, they would have the words of the morning star on their skin, literally, on their faces, if you will, and to have our language, um, uh, the light and the shadow on them. And that's what it looks like. It's really nice in the afternoon, the shadow starts to creep up that red wall and you can see the text up there too, it's, it's cool. So that was that. I think that might be it for that one. How are we doing on time? We're already over time. You guys, I had one more project. So now we have to save that for next time. I'm so sorry, but I tried to cram. I was saying earlier, I tried to cram a whole career into one PowerPoint and I, I couldn't do it, but here we go. I guess I'll end there. Thank you. Okay.